Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, uh, so we start this new section on visual memory and this has to do uh, with how uh, picture is perceived or visual images are uh, formed. Now at the beginning of this um, uh, section, I should tell you that visual imagery was something which was not very popularly taken in cognitive science and cognitive psychology. Uh, the reason because that uh, visual imagery cannot be tested, it is very difficult and so it is like what behaviorists used to say, there is no way of testing onto it. And so how do we understand visual imagery? Now let me ask you a question. You all live in a house or kind of an hostel and you have been living there for uh, a long period of time for certain periods of time. Now, the thing is if I ask you this question, all of you wherever you live, you have a window and I am perfectly sure that they you have and so if you have a window, it would have a window cell also. And so how many window cells do you have in your window? Now, let me give me a, give you a minute to think about it. So, you come up with an answer, let us say 4, 5, 6, 7, some people would say I do not have a window cell I, I or a window uh, frame onto it, some people would have glass windows and so there is no question of cell. Let me ask another question, you all live in a house or some kind of an hostel and so there are walls, there are uh, I am pretty sure most of your house have walls. Now, what is there? on the left wall from your bed and I will give you another minute to basically answer the question. So, all of you have a wall in your bedroom and so what is there on the left wall of your uh, house of your bedroom from the bed. So, left from the bed the wall which is there what do you have on it and so most people will have different different kind of answers, you will have a poster onto it, you would have uh, uh, maybe some shape onto it, some kind of distortions onto it or something or the other. Now, let us go back a little. Now, when I ask you this task or when I ask you to relate this task of telling me what you have on the wall or of uh, the question of how many window cells that you have on your window, how did you come up with an answer? Now, most people what they did was they went back mentally and reimagined the situation. Now, at this point of time when you are looking at this lecture, when you are hearing this lecture, you are obviously sitting uh, at, at maybe at your house, maybe at the place where you have these walls or not or you are uh, somewhere else, let us say in a garden look uh, sitting in look, understanding or sitting in uh, looking at this lecture. So, when these questions were posed to you, what you did was you mentally traveled back to that place and thought about the wall or made a, a structure of the wall. So, you went back from here, went back to the window, went back to your first to your room, then looked at your room mentally and this and remember all of these is happening mentally and then you turned yourself oriented yourself towards the window, counted the number of cell and then related back this to this information or you went to your uh, room, your bedroom, looked at the uh, bed, then looked at identified where is the left wall and once you have identified where the left wall is, then you looked at the, the image which is on the left wall and identified what is there. And so, this traveling back of you into these realms or in, in your house, mentally traveling back through your house and counting these cells or telling me what is on the wall is basically what is the process of visual imagery and the process of visual memory. So, basically visual memory is that kind of memory which stores visual representation of things. And so, 
as we saw that in uh, short term memory we use acoustic uh, uh, representations and in long term memory we use the semantic associations the meaning related representations visual representations and another representations which actually help us in remembering a, a lot of things. Now, the idea of visual representations of visually imagining together uh, of visually imagining something was something which was challenged uh, right from the very beginning in cognitive psychology although Alan Pavio did a lot of work in terms of visual uh, images. Now, stop here think about a coffee cup when you do that what really goes on in your brain. Now, scientists have looked at uh, the process of when you imagine something. So, when I am imagining when I am closing my eyes and imagining a coffee cup all the same processes which happen in perception for example, taking in the stimuli through the eye transfer of this image to the visual area from the visual area uh, which is occipital in the occipital lobe from there into the medial temporal lobe where it will be identified where it will be categorized or pattern matching will happen and from there a feedback given to the frontal area which will then make meaning from the input which is arriving from the medial temporal lobe. So, all this process happens in perception is the similar that happens in visual imagery except the one process and the process which does not happen in mental imagery is the input of stimulus from the eye because eyes are closed. So, when you are imagining the exact same processes go on to your brain as when you are perceiving something and so Coslin did a number of scanning experiments a number of work onto it a huge number of work onto it and basically related to these mental imageries. Now, as I said the debate to start with the debate was there about whether visual imagery is something which should be studied or visual codes is something which should be studied or not. Although it is very efficient these codes are very efficient and these are used in a number of situations, but uh, should be studied or not. And so, earlier psychologists had a problem with it for example, for one instance the behaviorists had a number of problem with it. The question is that visual images are personal to people right people have when I say imagine a coffee cup you are imagining on a coffee cup and this imagination is very personal to you and nowhere I can interfere on see a coffee cup and so there is no way for empirically testing it there is no way to testing the fact that whether you are imagining the coffee cup or not and so I cannot beat you or I cannot go ahead and any way verify whether you are imagining a cup or not and so you can fake and so once it does not when this process does not leads to uh, testing once this process does not lead to empirical testing the process that uh, the process itself should not be qualified to be called a science and so initially this was not studied a lot. But with the coming off of uh, the book called uh, mental representation the dual process approach by Alan Pavio this idea of visual codes or visual memory came to the forefront. So, what is visual memory exactly or what is visual imagery exactly it is the same thing as perception minus the perceptual input to the eye. So, visual imagery uses the same kind of input and as we will see in this section what is visual imagery what are the basic features of it why it is used and what are the benefits of using visual imagery. And so, visual imagery as I said is another kind of mental representation. For example, there are 4 or 5 kind of mental representations that are there. Mental representations are basically demonstration or mental representations are a copy of the physical representation. The physical world as it is copied into the psychological realm into the mind realm is mental representations. And so, 2 codes that we have looked before is the semantic code the semantic representation and the acoustic representation and with that we have the propositional representations and we also have the visual representation. So, we look into the propositional representations and the visual representations although the propositional representation is something which we looked at before in terms of Anderson's theory in the semantic memory where he talked about propositional thought and how propositional representations are represented into semantic memory. So, let us begin this section on visual memory. So, what is visual imagery? Visual imagery is basically information which passes through the brain as though something is being perceived when nothing actually is happening. So, when I gave you this task of looking at uh, the window sill or counting the window sills or looking at the wall in your house 
and uh, telling me what is on the wall. What you did was you imagined this, you started perceiving this, right? You started mentally going back to this and then thinking about it. And so, the process of mentally going back was similar to what perception is minus the input from the eye. All of the processes are same and as I related before in this uh, introduction that Coslin's scanning techniques or Coslin work on scanning where visual scanning represents or showed through an MRI that same areas of the brain get activated when you are visually imagining as when you are perceiving minus the input. So, more or less the same areas get activated right and so these are fmri studies which have been done on people when they are imagining something and when they are actually perceiving something so basically someone may experience sight smell sound and touch as a result of visual imagery when none of these stimuli are present so basically visual imagery also sim similar to visual imagery you can have different imageries also for example you could also have imagery of smell. So, when you imagine good food, when you imagine eating a pizza that is called the smell imagery or when you imagine some dog barking is auditory imaginations or touch imaginations where you have where you imagine that somebody touches you or something touched you that is haptic imaginations. And so, visual imagery is not confined itself to the visual domain, the imagery can also happen in different domains. So, imagery is a process which is exactly manifestation or which is basically a complete replica of the perceptual process, but minus the input system. Now, visual imagery involves the use of mnemonics. Now, visual imagery it furthers the use of mnemonics and these mnemonics actually help us in organizing knowledge and remembering knowledge better to, in, to improve recall. So, if we use mnemonics these, these are techniques of organizing knowledge or basically saving knowledge and so once we can do that we can also use this mnemonic techniques to remember information better. Look at this particular figure and then I ask you what do you see. So, I am pretty sure by now you are some answer to what you are seeing. So, it, it looks like a piece of a cake, it also looks like uh, some kind of uh, a sponge bob kind of uh, animal which has a carrot coming out or a horn coming out of the nose and it has it is a kind of a birthday thing. So, this is this is uh, like a complex picture or this is a manifestation which is there, but most people would have imagined something or other out of it. This is the idea of imagination when I show you this picture you think about something or or you imagine something to it. So, it could imagine it to be anything, it could be a party situation, it could be SpongeBob square pants, or it could be person having a birthday blast, or it could be two legs here, two hands here, the eye with the nose here, two eyes, or it could be this is the birthday cap that it has, and so on and so forth. So, an n number of imaginations and number of things, and when what you are thinking about it, the reply that you are giving to me is based on your imagination. So, what is mental imagery good for? One of the best things with this mental codes or mental representation is it enhances recall, it helps you in organizing knowledge and enhancing recall. And one way to do it is through using mnemonics and making mental codes out of it. So, what are mnemonics? These are uh, basically a process of making mental uh, representation in the visual format and then help us in organizing information and recalling them better. So, mnemonics involve the construction of mental picture of images which help us in increasing our chances of remembering information. So, as I said before it helps us in mentally creating a mental picture of something. Right. So, when I say imagine a coffee, you created a mental picture of it and so that is what mnemonics also does. It helps you, uh, helps, uh, you to create a mental picture and what does this mental picture then do? It helps in better remembering information and there are several techniques on mnemonics which are which can be used and so what we will do is we will use or we will see some of the techniques in this particular uh, section in this particular lecture. Now, one of the first and most famous technique of mnemonics that have been used for creating mental code and for uh, remembering things together for organizing information is called the method of loci. Now, what is the method of loci? The method of loci it requires the learner to imagine a series of places locations that have some sort of order to them. So, in this case what happens is if a large bit of information has to be imagined what I do is I create a mental image of 
a house or a number of locations and then tag each information into these locations. For example, if I have a lot of information to remember, let us say I have a list of words to remember. So, what do I do? I then remember a place, I then remember or I then imagine a uh, my house and several things in this house and then go ahead and tag each of this uh, list of words onto these places. So, next time when we th when I think about this house the tagged word with the house come back to forefront. So, imagine a case where you have been given 10 items to basically bring from the shop. So, suppose you want to remember a list of 10 items to shop and so we often when uh, we get in this situation we forget some of these items out of the 10 items at least 2 items we are bound to forget. But if you use mnemonics we will never forget because these are visual codes of remembering. So, let us say there are 10 items that we need to remember and so these are the 10 items that we need to remember in a shopping list. For example, bananas, eggs, milk, bread, cereal, cake, sugar, wine, flowers and chocolates. So, 10 different items which have been given to us and we need to go ahead and remember all of this and then do shopping for this while returning from our work. So, how do I uh, remember all these items? Now, since there are 10 items and the limit to short term memory is 7 plus or minus 2. So, the chances are that I will forget some of these. So, how do I make sure that I do not forget any of these items? One way of doing this is using a method of loci, uh, mentally creating a method of loci for it. And for that, I have, I have created a imagination space, a visual imagination. So, try imagining your front door, but with a huge banana instead of the visual handle. Then, uh, when you open the door and walk into the entrance, the floor is covered in eggs and you have to walk over the eggs to get into the living room. So, I am just creating an image first and then we will transform that into image. Then, imagine the eggs crackling under your feet and the mess. Anyway, it gets much messier because when you open the living room door, you are almost knocked off your feet by a river of the milk that comes gushing out. You stagger over the window to pull out the curtains which have turned into two giant slices of breads. Then you try to uh, turn on the TV but fail because that has been replaced by a very large packet of cereal. Time to have a sit down, but when you collapse on the sofa, you sink down into the sofa size ginger cake. So, the kitchen uh, you go to a kitchen for a drink, walking across the kitchen floor is a bit difficult as the knee deep in sugar and when you have reached the cattle, you find it is turned into a bottle of wine. Now, I prefer white, but you can visualize whatever color wine you want to. Now, give up and go for your mug of water. Unfortunately, when you reach down a mug, for the mug from the cupboard, it is filled with a bouquet of flowers and when you turn to the tap on his chocolate, not water but chocolate comes out of it. So, I created a scenario like this, I created a picture like this and see these are the 10 items which I want to remember. So, then this is the mental picture. So, there is where the banana is, here is where the eggs is which is crackling, these are the window curtains which are now like a bread, the TV turns out to be something where a giant cereal box and so I am sitting in the sofa which looks more or less like a gingerbread, bread I am sorry and then this. Uh, water turns out to be wine and chocolate comes out of the my tap and here are flowers. So, what I have done is I have taken all these things and put them into this figure. Now, next time when I am although this is a very very hilarious figure. So, next time when I am into the shop I just have to remember this figure and this is called the method of loci. What I have done is each location the door is the location and now I have associated the banana with it. Similarly, curtains is the location on which I have tagged on the bread and similarly, TV is a location on in your house which I have tagged up to be the now the cereal. Similarly, the sofa is a location on to which I have made the gingerbread and the other locations as well. So, this is the method of loci where what I do is a very famous place, a place which I am very familiar to is taken and then items which have been learned on to or which you want to learn on that is tagged on to each place on to these location and this is the method of loci. It is a very it is a funny fair, funny picture and it is very easy to remember. A next technique that can be used for easing out 
or using visual code is called the technique of interacting images. So, here it is very simple what we need to do is states that the recall of concrete nouns on a list is improved when participants were told to form images of the words in comparison to when they were not given such instruction. And so, the technique of inter interacting images says that when we have to learn words in a list it is better to form mental imagery of the nouns concrete nouns and then interact and make an interaction between different words in a noun. For example, in a paired word recall test of the pairs dog and pipe, dog and pipe were the item of this paired recall test. So, if that is to be remembered what the easiest way to do is to remember the image of a dog and to imagine the image of a pipe and then to interact this picture together imagine the picture of a dog which is smoking a pipe and that is what it is. So, image of a dog smoking a pipe will make better recall than images of the dog and pipe kept together. The reason is that it is funny and it is novel and so humor is one of the easiest way of remembering things. So, instead of then thinking about the dog separately and the pipe separately I can think about a dog smoking a pipe and this basically is the easiest way. So, dog is basically a concrete noun and pipe is basically a concrete noun. So, what I have done is I have created an image with dog and pipe interacting together or dog smoking pipe, dog smoking pipe and this is much easier or much better way to remember. So, technique of interacting images says that if you have a number of con, uh, concrete nouns or imagine these nouns and then make images of these nouns interacting together and that is an easy way to remember things. A third method which is not so visual which is not use uses visual imagery for remembering can also be used and this method is called the peg word method. So, what we do here is that it involves picturing the item with another set of ordered cues pegging them onto the cue. So, basically if uh, in, in this case what we do is there is an ordered list that we know and we then peg the new item onto the ordered list. Now, in this case the cues are not locations, but rather nouns that come from a memorized uh, list. So, in case of uh, the method of loci there are certain nouns certain locations which have been used. So, we use the door as a location and the banana onto the door. In this case we do not use locations rather we use a number of concrete nouns which come from a memorized list. So, those lists that we learn when we are very small in class nursery and all. So, those lists are there and so we can go ahead and, and tag or basically peg a new word onto those lists and we can remember. And so, a good example is here. All of you know this list. So, we know 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 kind of a thing and so, uh, 1 is now related to the word bun. 2 is related to shoe, 3 is related to tree, 4 is related to door. Similarly, 20 is related to 20, 30 is related to dirty, 40 related to warty, 11 to liver, 12 to elf, 13 to thirsting, 14 to forking, 16 to witching, 70 to heavenly and 80 to weighty. So, basically what we have done is since we know uh, there, there was also some rhyme called 1, 2, buckle my shoe, 3, 4, shut the door, 5, 6 pick up the sticks kind of a thing. Uh, so, basically these are memorized lists. So, we know 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is something which is taught to us very early on or A for apple, B for ball, C for cat, D for doll. So, A, B, C, D is a structure which we know beforehand or 1, 2, 3, 4 is a structure which we know beforehand. And so, when we want to learn a list of concrete nouns, we peg them together, we tag them together. Now, one part the Q part of the list is coming from memory and it is a memorized list. The target part is what we peg on to and so, since that Q is easier, the Q is memorized, tagging the target is easier for us to remember this paired recall. And so, this is the third method and so, this method does not use imagery because what we are doing is we are using a memorized list. Whereas, the first two methods use imagery, the third method is not using imagery because it is using some kind of a memorized list for remembering. Now, in order to study mnemonics generally use visual imagery and how visual imagery functions there are two ways of explaining how these mnemonics really work. The what is the way in which these mnemonics actually go ahead and work and so how do they lead to better recall. Now, one of 
these approaches of how pneumatics actually work is provided by Alan Pavio in his book in his uh, 1983 book which is mental representations and dual coding approach. Now, his book talks about how mental representations are what mental representations are and so what Alan Pavio's in very simple words what his proposal is uh, originated from the dual coding hypothesis of memory. So, he get a dual coding hypothesis of memory where which he says is the main reason for pneumonics to work. So, why do pneumonics actually work? Why do making mental imagery of things actually work in terms of better remembrance is because there is something called the dual coding approach uh, which is proposed by Alan uh, Pavio. And what is this uh, idea that he propagated? He says that the LTM contains two distinct coding systems. So, the long term memory has not just the semantic coding system, there is another coding system which is out there uh, for representing information to be stored. So, Alan Pavio believes that the LTM uses two different codes for storing information. One of it is called is in the verbal domain. So, one code which is used by the long term memory for storing information is verbal which contains information about items abstract linguistic meaning. So, those meanings which are abstract, those meanings which are uh, semantic in nature, those meanings which are linguistic in nature are generally stored as the visual code and the other involves imagery, the mental picture of some sort uh, that represents what the item looks like. So, remember in uh, the concepts and categorization we looked at the best way of concepts and categorization was the exemplar method. And so, looking at exemplar how do you remember an exemplar? So, exemplar has certain features, certain abstract features that are verbal in nature and then it has a visual feature also. For example, how do we remember a car? We can remember a car by its model and also certain abstract features. For example, it has an engine, it has four doors, four windows, it has seat for seating, it is a method of transposition and so these all these methods are or all these features are verbal in nature, but the model of the car that comes to mind when you are thinking about it is visual in nature. And so, what he says is there are two basically uh, codes in LTM. The verbal is basically abstract linguistic meaning and the imagery that is the mental picture of some sort of representation that the item looks like. How does it look like? What is the example of it? Now, Pavio's idea is that picture and concrete words give rise to both verbal labels and visual images. So, when you imagine something there are two codes that actually run. There are two different ways or two different formats in any kind of remembrance in any kind of storing that happens in memory. One is the visual and the other is verbal label. So, when I am thinking of an angry man, when I am asked to remember an angry man, what my LTM does, it not only flashes the word angry man, but it also flashes the model, this angry man model or this person who looks angry. Also, when we are looking at the word survivor, I am also my brain is also looking at this kind of a thing. When I am thinking about Elvis Presley, uh, my mind is also having an image of it. And so, this is the verbal label and this is the imagery label and so they combine together to form the final code in LTM. So, my LTM then stores two codes for everything, a visual code and a imaginary code. The uh, verbal code is the one in which the linguistic uh, abstract propositions are uh, stored onto and the imaginary code is exactly an example of it. So, when I am thinking of a sick child, this is the image that I am thinking or toddler, this is what the image comes to, shoes, this is what the image comes to. And so, what Alan Previous says is that these two codes interact together to form the final representation or final imagery that happens in long term memory. Now, in addition to what Alan Pavio says in his dual coding hypothesis that there are two codes, the visual code and the verbal code which actually go ahead and form the representation in memory. There is another explanation to it which is called the relational organizational hypothesis. And so, what is the relational organizational hypothesis? This hypothesis was presented by Bauer in 1970 B 
uh, I am sorry the B is the study which I am talking about. So, in 1970 he published two papers and one paper was uh, not on the relational I organization hypothesis B is a reference to this paper. So, in 1970 he proposed uh, the relational organizational hypothesis and what is the hypothesis say it is the theory states that imagery improved memory not because images are necessarily richer. So, the reason why imagery improves memory is not because images are rich then verbal labels. It is not that images are richer in the sense that it can be thought of it can be imagined or it can uh, creates a model a visual model of it not that reason then verbal level, but because imagery produces more associations between the items to be recalled. Now, when I think about imagine about something it lends itself to a number of folks. When I think about something when I imagine something when I imagine about a particular picture or a particular fact and a number of hooks are made or number of connections are made number of associations are made. So, when I think about a sick child the word sick child will not be that much you know, better than uh, the idea that when I think about a sick child and think about the image of a sick child when I do that a number of associations will be formed of uh, about his condition about so many other variables which are there and so that will lead to better remembering it. So, when the word sick child comes in front of me it is not a better code, but when a face of a sick child comes into me it will associate with it the emotion chair will and that is why it is said that pictures speak a thousand words. It will give so many different associations not only for the fact that who is this child is, why is he sick, what is he sick like and so on and so forth. So, it relates so many information out of it and that is the reason why it is better. So, forming an image typically requires a person to create a number of links or hooks between the information to be remembered and the other information and that is what I said when you imagine something when I imagine a sick child it is not just the sick child word that I am thinking about or the idea that the child is sick when I am seeing an image of a sick child there are so many things I am imagining. For example, I am imagining a positive non positive about him I am feeling a sad mood when I am seeing a sick child. Also I am thinking about what kind of disease does he have, how does it look like, where does he come from, what are his background, what are his parent like, what is his age, whether he is a Caucasian or whether he is an Asian or what kind of other things which is there. So, thinking about a sick child or imagining a sick child will create so many associations and so many different different cues for it to be remembered then just the word we uh, sick child because the word sick child has a meaning related form, but the picture of a sick child will create a number of cues onto it. So, Bauer in 1970 he, exp he ran an experiment to distinguish dual coding hypothesis from relational organizational hypothesis and what is the experiment like. So, what he did was he gave people two letter words to start with also so he gave people two letter words to start with and so these two letter words were either to be remembered just as words to be remembered just as images or to be remembered as interacting images and so in a pad recall test this is the experiment that he did and he uh, bauer gave people or subjects to remember word pairs right and so first group so, this is the word pair that people had to remember. So, train and wall is the word pair that people had to remember. Now, there were three groups which were asked to do that. In the first group there is an overt road repetition. So, people will be shown train and a wall and they will be asked to recall this word pair. And so, this is just one entry of the list there are several entries which are there. So, first group will only see the train in a wall and this is a verbal code. So, people have been shown this verbal code and they have been asked to, to do rote repetitions to remember this or to learn this by heart. Group 2 saw two images, one they saw a train, the other they saw a wall and so these people were shown images of both the Q target. So, mostly in my paired associate learning I have a Q word and a target word. The Q word is the one which comes before the target is the one which is connected to the Q word. So, in my train wall 
my train is the Q word and the wall is the target word. So, when I say train you will have to say wall or when I present train you will have to present come up with the answer of wall. Similarly, in this case in the first group people were made to learn the verbal code for train and wall. In the second group people were shown a train and a wall which are not interacting with each other and they were asked to remember the whole list in this way. A third group was there where an interacting image was made. So, in this case a train and a wall infused together. So, now I see a train coming out of the wall. So, this looks like a great wall of China and a train forming with this and so this is the interacting image. And so, later on a recall of this word pad list was done and what was the answer to this or what was the result of this? People who do, did remote did not do these associations or learn the list through verbal code they produced 30 percent they were efficient 30 percent of the time and their accuracy was 30 percent. Whereas, people who just learned separate images their recall was not better or their recall was worse than the recall of people who did wrote uh, repetitions or which learn the list through a verbal code. But people who formed interacting images they produced the highest number of accuracy rate of 53 percent which basically means that when people use images and interact images the a more number of hooks are made. Here the images have a number of hooks, but they are not connected. But here what has happened is one image hook is now related to the other image hook and so a number of cues are now present and so train wall could be very easily remembered for it. And so, this is Bauer's experiment in which what he found out is that the more number of hooks that I have the better the reputation or better the recall of a test like this. And so, his idea is that why imagery is better is because it lends itself to forming a number of hooks number of remembering paradigms. Now, what is the existence of imagery? So, Lee Brooks in 68 they hear some of the best evidence that images are distinct from verbal materials or images are better than verbal materials or at least use different processes than the verbal materials. So, Lee Brooks did a number of experiments, some experiments to show that verbal materials are better than verbal materials and they use the verbal and the visual materials use different codes for tagging. So, in one of these experiments a letter like this was uh, presented to people and then Nestric sign was there and so what people were asked to do is to mentally move right. So, this is an arrow and mentally move anti clockwise. So, move clockwise mentally from star to mark each corner as the topmost and bottom most uh, that is there. So, you have to give an answer and there were two ways to give an answer first what you have to do is look at this f start from the asterisk sign move clockwise mentally to mark each corner. So, these are all corners as the topmost or the bottommost corner. And so, that is what you have to do this corner, this corner, this corner, this corner, this corner, this corner, this corner. You have to tell me whether these corners are the topmost or bottommost. And so, the answers of this has to be provided in a response sheet like this. Either people have to say verbally yes or no or people have to mark their answers into y y y n n n. So, each time when you go from corner to corner whether this is the topmost or bottommost you have to put a circle like this onto y on n. One way of responding the other way of responding was verbally say yes and no right. So, this is one uh, experiment. In the other experiment uh, people were asked to indicate for each word whether it is concrete noun or not concrete noun. So, people were asked to relate back whether each word in this a bird in the hand is not in the bush and so relate back whether each of this particular word is a concrete noun or is not a concrete noun and that is what you have to do that is what was supposed to be done. And same uh, example here the same kind of response here what do you think happened? What was the result of the experiment like this? Now, the result of this experiment was people who use imagery people who was mentally moving things together they were better off in terms of circling this y n n rather than verbally presenting an answer and people who were asked to relate back the concrete noun those people were better off saying verbally yes and no rather than say circling the y and n. 
which basically proves that there are two different codes. When you are doing something mentally, when you are doing a job mentally, when you are rotating mentally in a clockwise direction and finding out whether any corner is the topmost, the bottommost, then in those cases, visually, because since you are using visual imagination, visually marking is better, produces better accuracy. Then in the case in which you are verbally verifying a sentence and finding out whether a noun is concrete or not and answering also verbally. And so that was the answer to that. So people in the spatial location, people in the F verification, spatial verification, visual imagery exists. It basically visual imagery is present and they help us. A visual imagery helps us in remembering things better, in helps us in better remembering. Also, there are certain other tasks which were used to form, to basically show that visual imagery exists. And so, one of this is uh, comparison task. And so, people may ask these questions, whether a truck is bigger than a car, a truck is bit, uh, bigger than a bicycle or a truck is bigger than a van. Now, if these questions were asked, People were faster in telling a truck is bigger than a bicycle than telling those basically relating to those uh, giving answers to those questions which says that truck is whether it is related to a van or not. So, whether truck is bigger than a van, the answers were slow uh, in comparison to those questions in which it was asked whether truck is related to a bicycle. The answer here is that people create mental images of a truck and a bicycle and do the comparison. So, when we are creating mental images of a truck and a van, they almost look similar and so comparisons are slow. A number of comparisons has to be done and so the answers are slow. But when you are looking at a bicycle and, and a truck, there are too many differences in it and so the comparison is faster and much better and much smoother than in the first case. And this is basically called the symbolic distance effect, which basically means that if two items are further apart or have greater distances in comparison standards, they are faster verified in terms of mental imagery than when they are close together in a particular comparison standard. So, basically in this section, then what we did was we looked at what is mental imagery, we saw what mental images are and we also saw what is this kind of code. As I said before, we have looked at different codes and here we looked at another interesting code which the LTM has which is called visual imagery. We also looked at some very interesting ways of helping you remember a number of things or helping you perform better in an exam by using mnemonics and I showed you three different techniques which are there. One of the technique is the method of loci. What we tend to do is imagine a place that you know uh, very well and then uh, tag on the list of words that you want to remember onto certain locations on that list. A uh, second method is called peg word method in which what you tend to do is remember a number of in the peg word method in a, a rote memorized list and so you peg uh, whatever has to be remembered into particular list that you already remember peg the new word onto that. And third model or basically a third way of a third mnemonic method is the interacting image theory in which what you do is make two images and make them interact together. And once you make an interacting image of two images that will be better remembered or that will help you into better remembrance. We also saw evidences of the fact that imagery does exist and if imagery exists that we saw that if a task is of a particular type then a particular kind of imagery or a particular kind of response responses better. We also saw the certain reasons of what how imagination or mnemonics really work. So, there are two ways of looking into it either looking at Alan Pavio's idea of interacting images of two different codes how they interact together or the idea of Bauer where he proposes the relational hypothesis where he says that interacting images are much better than the simple mere images, simple mere sol solitudinal images. So, we conclude this uh, section here, we will again continue with this section in the next lecture. For now, goodbye.